All right, good morning. God, this is a great wake up to like the lights. <laughs> um, so welcome to the last round of lightning talks. Um, some people are, woo, yes. <laughs> I was hoping maybe a few more people would be here since we didn't have that fun run, but all right, it's Sunday. I, I, I can understand that. <laughs> um, so we'll just jump right in. Um, uh, we're going to take a look at um, ergonomics. Um, um, sorry. Uh, take a look at your keyboard. All right. Uh, have you looked at your keyboard? How did you choose your keyboard? Did you choose it because it has cool blue LEDs or the company that made it has a Z in its name? Or are you using the keyboard that came with your computer? In all of these cases, you are probably doing it wrong. The keyboard is the analog to digital interface that you use the most. It's what makes your physical movements into code. But of course, it's not created for this. It's created for mechanical typewriters, and therefore, it has straight rows with staggered keys. And that's not always the best thing to type at. But there are basically two modes of typing, and the first school of typing is called home row touch typing, and the second school is, uh, doesn't exist. And home row touch typing um, means that you're supposed to hold your hands like this. But how is this guy actually holding his hands? Is that they're like attached to his center of his chest and he's typing like this? So that, that's not how it actually looks. It looks like this. And this puts strain on your wrists and can lead to pain. And therefore, if you are a touch typist, you should have a keyboard that looks kind of like this or something like that some sort of ergonomic keyboard. You may, at some Python script, see people who have keyboards like this. They tend to be quite fanatical about them and drag them around the world. They're probably awesome if you're a type, type, touch typist. If you're not, ergonomical keyboards or keyboards that are split in two parts are annoying. So if you're new, no school typing, you actually want to have the classical uh, straight keyboards. Buyers beware here, there's two major physical keyboard layouts, ISO and ANSI, and not only using uh, the layout you're not used to, it's annoying because the enter key is in different places. Uh, ANSI is missing a key by the left shift you see here. And that happens to be the key in many language layouts where larger and and smaller and is, uh, which means that you can't type HTML. So that's kind of annoying if you're a web developer. The developer. And also, do you use the numerical keyboard? Because the keyboard layout that we use is designed by IBM for mainframes, where you in the 60s typed in a lot of numbers. That's what we were doing with computers then. But today, we don't use the numerical keyboard very much. And that means it's just in the way, it means you have to have your arm further to the right. This can lead to shoulder pain, especially for people who have narrow shoulders, like then women or me. Um, so it's just in the way, but if you go to a store and try to buy a keyboard without a numerical keypad, it's usually a mini keyboard with mini keys, and you definitely don't want that. The name of a Full-size keyboard that has not, doesn't have a numerical keypad is a 10-keyless keyboard, and you typically need to buy them online. Um, they're also usually kind of expensive because they're more, more or less made by hand because you can get them with whatever, whatever layout you want and usually whatever uh, colors of the keys you want and stuff like that. So you can have keys that are specially uh, adapted keyboard layouts for Vim and things like that with different colors. Also, you have to think about what kind of keys you should use because there's loads of loads of actual physical keys and they differ in the mechanical design and how much noise they make and how much tactile feedback they make and uh, how long the key will travel when you push it. And cheap keyboards can give you serious pain. I had a keyboard that if you pressed it hard and fast, it would kind of hit you twice in the fingers. Um, so here I can only recommend that you read and read and read on a wiki on, that's called Deskthority. So remember this, deskthority.net slash wiki, and it has crazy amounts of information on keyboards and switches. The most popular switches amongst people who actually look at the keyboard are called Cherry MX, and they have different colors. 
Uh, and I, after much research, bought a tankyless keyboard that uses Cherry MX Brown switches with dampener rings, lowers the noise of the key and shortens the travel. So this is uh, a success for me. I'm very happy with it. You should all take a look at your keyboard and do some research on what you actually want and need. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't see the Apple keyboard there. I, should I change my keyboard? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so next up, we have Mark talking about um, Python and in genomics, automation, an analysis, and visualization. Yeah, so hi, everyone. I want to talk about how we use uh, Python and bioinformatics in my lab for uh, genomic studies. So the first step is going to be to talk a bit about how they actually work. So the first step is the design and recruit, uh, recruitment, where we actually talk to patients, uh, sign consent forms, and ask them if they want to be in the city. Then there's the data acquisition, which is uh, to start from the chromosome, which is a physical, biological entity, and to digitalize it into a, a DNA that we can read on the computer. And then, uh, because the technology we use for this is, uh, is cheaper, we only have access to some of the bases of the DNA, so we actually have missing values. So we use imputation to actually guess from the surrounding and correlated positions the DNA uh, bases at positions we don't have on the, on the uh, initial raw data. So this is imputation is the same concept as in general statistics, but in uh, genomics, it's actually guessing the DNA bases we don't have. And then uh, we actually want to do some analysis. So most, most of the time, it's to associate uh, genetic uh, markers with human traits or diseases. So we use uh, regression techniques to do that. I'll talk more about them later. And finally, if we're lucky and we find something useful, we usually try to publish it in a scientific journal. Uh, here, since I'm talking about Python, I'm only going to focus on the imputation analysis, analysis steps, because that's what uh, we use Python for. So I wanted to talk about the genome-wide imputation pipeline, which is a tool we developed to actually do the imputation. So just to, cl to clarify, to make sure everyone uh, follows me on imputation, uh, to the left, the input is actually the, the data with the missing values. So the question marks represent bases we don't uh, have uh, actual reading for. Uh, so, so some letters are missing. And then we use GWP, which uh, wraps around uh, specialized programs like uh, Impute2, Shape It, and Plink to guess uh, the missing bases. So hopefully, uh, we get a, a, a high confidence prob probabilities for those missing values, uh, as seen on the right, where we have all the, the missing DNA letters for these patients. So uh, this might look simple, but actually uh, GWIP wraps uh, uh, these tools and uh, takes care of handling all the intermediate, intermediate files that are generated. It's a very high number. It's very tedious to handle by hand, so it's very useful for that. And also uh, it takes care of parallelism, so it's very uh, good at uh, going faster on uh, high-performance computing clusters using the DRMA API. And this is all in Python. Also, after that, uh, you actually need to write your quality report for your boss, which is going to ask uh, if you have high confidence in your DNA uh, calls and all that. Uh, we used to do that by hand, but now with GWIP, you can actually get automatic report generation. So this is really cool. And we use uh, LaTeX and uh, Jinja to do templates, which are customizable for different projects. And then the report is going to get generated in, uh, in a PDF form. So this is another uh, kind of automation we do with uh, GWIP. Then we go to analysis. So analysis is really similar to what uh, people do in statistics in uh, different fields. So this is an example with the uh, LDL cholesterol level, which is the bad cholesterol. So say we have uh, one SNP, one uh, genetic marker. Uh, we have three genotypes. So here, as you can see, as you add the G allele, people have a higher cholesterol level. So this is the kind of association we're looking for. And to detect them, we use uh, classic statistical techniques like uh, linear regression, uh, regression or GLMs. And all this we do with the uh, standard uh, Python uh, statistical analysis stack like, and uh, stats models and uh, lifelines for survival analysis and stuff like that. Also keep in mind that we do this for uh, stuff like 7 million markers. So this is huge. Uh, those are huge data sets and a lot of tests we need to run. So GWIP also takes care of uh, making this in parallel yeah, using the, the underlying tools. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about is uh, visualization. So this is a matplotlib plot. Uh, so the y-axis is the, the p-values, which are results of the statistical test. And the x-axis is the, all the ordered variants. 
so th this is a good way of seeing quickly the results of the 7 million uh, tests. This is only a restricted subset I'm showing here, but this is actual real da data that was uh, published. So the, the little mountain you, you see with the red dots at the top is actual, a, a real actual genetic association signal. And uh, this plot shows a lot more like uh, the correlation between the different bases using the, the color. Uh, if, uh, if the markers were impu imputed or genotyped on the, on the actual machine, and the uh, genes in the region are all shown here. So to finish, I'd like to thank uh, my advisor and the GWIP main author, uh, Louis Philippe, and all my fellow uh, lab members. If you're interested in seeing how it's written and the stuff it can do, it's on uh, GitHub, so feel free to come and see this. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, next step. Heard a little preview of uh, some gaming music, maybe? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so we have uh, Daniel talking about writing an award-winning uh, adventure game uh, in Python 3. Um, hi, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm a professional Python programmer, but my hobby is uh, programming computer games in Python. Um, so uh, who here has heard of PyWeek? Some people have. Um, so PyWeek is uh, a, this is the PyWeek website, it's pyweek.org. Um, it's uh, a games programming competition in which you are challenged to write a game from scratch with, no, uh, with only published libraries, no personal code bases, in exactly one week uh, on a theme that is given to you at the moment the contest starts. And then you have one week, you have to uh, enter your game um, the day after that sort of seven day programming period. Um, and in October 20, is this, is, there's been sort of 20 Pi Weeks, 19 Pi, I don't know, uh, a lot of Pi Weeks so far, but it, the, they run twice a year. And in October, the theme selected was One Room. And I won. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I you know, sometimes like to, to joke that I am the world champion Python games programmer. Uh, um, so I wanted to show you my game, uh, which. Uh, this, uh, so this, this is a little way into the game, um, and uh, it's, it's set in one room, obviously. So if, uh, does somebody want to call out something to try? Pick up the sock. Okay, so... Uh, something else? Poke the bird. Poke the bird, okay, yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right. So, um, uh, right. So, uh, so this, this, all of this uh, action uh, that's that's happening. It's a complete adventure game. It's a, I call it an adventure stage play because it's actually uh, a lot more linear and scripted than some adventure games, um, and that's you know partly down to the constraints of trying to do it in one week. Um, but this, so I, I started, I sat down on the Sunday of Pi Week, which is the first day of Pi Week, and uh, I started writing a script. And very soon I realized that I wanted the script to be executable. Um, and so I wrote a parser, and uh, I eventually evolved this into a whole DSL, domain specific language, for uh, defining an adventure game. So here's the, this is actually the start of the game, and there's, there's an include with some, some uh, additional bindings. But then, you know, the, the character will get the square brackets are stage directions, and the, anything that sort of starts with capital letters and then a colon is something that somebody says. Um, uh, and then there are bindings in Python for, for each of these stage directions and things. Um, oh. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, and so this is uh, some of the other syntax. This is uh, to allow you to, this, so allow and deny directives uh, allow, allows you to actually do something. It sort of plays the default thing and deny. Uh, uh, you can, it makes it so that you can try that thing, but it will not let you do it. Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's more and more syntax to, uh, to do the various things that I needed to do in the game. Um, and all of those stage directions, so the, you could say um, Goblet, who's the main character, moves to center stage, and center stage will be one of those things. These are all defined in Inkscape, um, and the uh, purple section is the navigable floor area. And that, that's all done in screen space. So it looks a little bit 3D, but actually it's being rooted uh, in like the 2D space of the window. Um, so it's like a slightly modified routing algorithm, so it looks like he's crossing the floor. Um, 
But that allows you to then define you know, whole plays um, without writing any Python, any additional Python code. Um, so, uh, Py, Py game on Python 3 works. Um, the binaries are available, but it's not been released. And on Mac, you have to compile it yourself with Homebrew, which seems horrible, but maybe that's familiar to Mac people. Um, but then I, uh, so, some lessons to take away. Um, I think the approach of writing a script uh, and executing it was brilliant. Um, and as always, doing that up front gives you the whole direction for the game. So that's a, a really good practice. Uh, but then writing an adventure game in a week is hard because there are so many object combinations that you, so every time that you try using the sock with the kettle, uh, you really want a, a non-canned response about you know, why that doesn't work. Um, and that's a lot of effort, but uh, it's possible if you have more time to spend. It's possible in a week. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Pygame is, uh, if you just keep your game to Pygame, that's a really good way of doing it. So that's it, that's, that's the uh, URL if you want to download it. I've been Lord Mauve. Thank you. Awesome. All right, next up we have uh, Pierre-Francois uh, talking about managing your science lab in Python. Hello everyone, I'm Pierre-Francois. I'm a physics student from McGill University in uh, Montreal. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk about how to uh, use Python in the lab. So uh, I work in low temperature physics. This is a picture of my lab. Uh, you can see lots of doors and lots of instruments and pipes everywhere. So as I say, we use a lot of different uh, measure devices. And uh, before, uh, scientists would have to take data from this thing, put that in their lab book, and then analyze that later. But now we can communicate with the device and connect that to a computer to uh, record that. And then the problem, there is a lot of different measure devices and a lot of different softwares. So they usually come with like little APIs of software, but it's quite difficult to make them cross-talk and have like different instruments from different companies uh, because the companies do not want to collaborate together to make a, a, a better uh, life for a scientist. So uh, one of the solutions is LabVIEW. And here I'm just kidding because that's what a LabVIEW code looks like. And this is actual code. So there's no script. That's the scripting version. And that's for like a moderate size uh, project. Moreover, you also have proprietary license and uh, backward compatibility issues. So if you have like the newer version of uh, LabVIEW, you can open the, few, the earlier ones, but if you have the earlier version, you cannot open the newer ones. And uh, again, the upper part is code and the other one is interface. So that's why the solution is more likely to be Pythonic. So uh, what we did, we wrote the driver uh, of the instrument with uh, Python, and we used that to connect the instrument using PyVisa, PySerial, PyUSB, or TCP IP, which I forgot here. And uh, we managed the communication with the instrument using its own uh, communication protocol. So all, all the instruments have their li little communication protocol given with usually, or you can extract them by emailing hard the uh, uh, people who make the instrument. And uh, then we made a little uh, GUI in which we can connect all the different instruments and set up uh, our experiments. I'll show you the GUI afterwards. I'm using threads to take and plot data at the same time so it doesn't uh, lag. I use QD signals to talk between threads and exchange information. And uh, because the experiment is what changes, because we want to be able to use that a different person in the lab use the same instrument, but we don't do the same thing with that. So we, we said that the experiment is just in a file, which is loaded and uh, executed. And you can describe what procedure you want to do with your instrument. So I'm just going to show you how the interface looks like. So here you have the little uh, instrument rack. So you can choose instrument for uh, lots of different drivers. Here you can connect that to a lot of different parts. This is just a debug mode. You can select different uh, things you want to measure from your instrument. Uh, in here in the main window, we have the Q widget area. We can add more plots, and we can add a lot of widgets. So the, the cool thing with that is we made it so that we can uh, implement new things as we need it and not be like uh, uh, slaves from a, a program which is given to us by 
uh, a company. And if we want a new feature, we can easily uh, add it. And uh, that's how uh, data would look like. And then you can edit the color or this kind of thing. So you can all make that uh, really nicely uh, using Python. And uh, the, so the advantage is you have a lot of uh, modularity and reusability with the instrument drivers. So once the instrument driver is written, you can uh, improve them and you can share that with other people that will use the same instrument. Uh, you can, as I said, the experiment part is done in a script and you can just change the script but still use all the GUI. You don't have to redo it. And uh, you can uh, improve the program by, I, I added like a function that can make uh, uh, on-fly uh, plotting and add email notification and other things because Python has a lot of uh, 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 help and people developing other stuff. So it's really easy to take that and implement that into the thing to make uh, an actual device that work well to uh, uh, serve your purposes. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. If you want to see the project, uh, you can go and download it on the web page. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so my employer, Spotify, has been very public about uh, its use of Agile, and I think it works really well when done correctly. So I'm really excited to hear um, Walter Reed talking about the scientific foundation of Agile. Okay. All right, some guy gave a five-minute talk on the scientific foundations of Agile, and you won't believe what happened next. So it's a very deep topic. Um, in fact, it, you can't do it in five minutes, so the purpose of this talk is to whet your appetite, and maybe, who knows, I'll come back next year and do a, a full session, so make sure you vote. Um, so that's me, really quickly. Uh, Agile, so, so who's, who's heard of Agile? Raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand, keep it up if you're doing Agile. Keep your hands up if you really kind of feel like you understand all the tools and, and why they work the way they do. So, uh, less hands, right? So, a lot of times a tool like Agile feels like a set of tools, but it actually has a deeper foundation. And in uh, the four minutes I have left, I want to convince you it's based on the scientific method. And if we look at it that way, we understand the tools better and we utilize the tools better. So, a review of the scientific method. This is middle school science, so we form a hypothesis, step one. Step two, we actually do an experiment or collect some data. Step three, we check our results. Did, you know, was it consistent with my hypothesis? And step four, we take action, publish a paper, or maybe redo our, our experiment, all right? So, this also applies to management systems. Edward Deming, the, the quality guru who transformed manufacturing in Japan, he was really key to applying this to how we do kind of our systems, our processes. And he called it plan, to, plan, do, check, act, which is the same four steps as the scientific method, but in ways that was less intimidated to management. Nothing against management. So it's also known as PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. It's also known as the scientific method. And it's really simple, yet it's deceitfully hard to do. Uh, a lot of companies or teams do PDPD, which is Plan, Do, Plan, Do. They never actually check did, uh, you know, what I did actually meet my hypothesis. A lot of companies do or teams do PDCA, which is Plan, Do, Complicate, Abandon. <laughs> Okay, I see a few teams uh, who, who practice this, right? So um, here's the key takeaway. You, your work will be better if you use scientific thinking. And we ta often think about the longer cycles. All right, in three months, I'm going to check my project and do a review. But scientific thinking happens on our day-to-day, -day, like within hours and minutes. So I'm going to give you a couple examples again, just to give you a glimpse. So there was a presentation, What Programmers Can Learn From Pilots, by Andrew Godwin. It was a fantastic presentation. And he said they use checklists. So if I ask what the purpose of checklists were, people generally say, well, it makes sure everyone's doing the same thing consistently. But you know, I do checklists even if I'm only the, the only person that's going to do the, the checklist. The checklist is actually the scientific method. So we plan our work, the checklist. We do it, right? We go down the checklist. And then we, did we get the desired output of the checklist? And if we did not, what should we do? Update the checklist, right? Those are the four steps. But so many people, right? They, oh, this checklist is suboptimal. I'm not going to use that. No, you're only doing PD. You're not doing the C and A. So checklist is a scientific method. If I follow these steps, I expect a certain outcome. If I do these things, I'll have a successful server restart. So, when we use the scientific method, it helps us improve our processes, not just do our processes. Okay, so checklist, super simple. We don't need to overcomplicate them. 
Kanban, who uses Kanban? Love Kanban, yeah, a few hands, okay. So um, wh what's the primary purpose of Kanban? Anybody, really quick, primary purpose? Flow, okay. So yes, it definitely helps with flow. Um, there is a primary purpose, and I'll explain, um, we're generated from manufacturing, but um, it's actually to, to limit work and uh, progress, which then helps us do flow, and I'll explain that. But if we don't understand that, how do we know if we're using the tool correct correctly? We don't, right? So Kanban came out of manufacturing, and it was to limit the, the work in progress. So WIP is bad in manufacturing because you have manufacturing, you have warehouse costs, you have damage to your materials, obsolete. Also inc increases your lead time when you have like a, a new project or product and it has to go through all the way through the inventory to get to the other side to, to start using that. With human work, right, we don't have warehouses and whatnot, but why is it bad? So more science. If we work on a project 100% of the time, how long does it take to finish a 40-hour project? 40 hours, very good. So I finished my first uh, project in week one, and then week two I got another one, week three, week four, great. What happens in real life when I work on four projects 25% of the time? How long does it take to complete a 40-hour project? Still 40 hours, but now I just stretch the lead time of each one of those projects to four weeks, right? I've made three of those projects have a longer lead time. So the purpose of Kanban limits our work in progress so we can reduce our lead time. And if we understand that, we're using the scientific method. So if we use checklists to improve our processes of, of our common repetitive tasks and use Kanban to limit our work in progress, then we will become more effective at improving our processes and we will shorten the lead time of our work. What's not to like about that, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Last lightning talk of the morning. I have Manish talking about functional programming ideas in Python. So, hi, my name is Manish. Uh, I work in Rackspace uh, on uh, Autoscale product. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, taking ideas from the functional programming world and applying that to Python and imperative, uh, other imperative languages. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep, it's, sorry, yeah. <laughs> this. Can you do it without slides? Ooh. Ooh. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the, um, the idea here is to think about the core behavior of your application um, and what is the logic behind it, and see if you can uh, represent it as a bunch of pure functions. And once you start doing that, there are a lot of advantages of pure functions, and uh, the ob one of the most obvious ones are uh, obviously no side effects, and you have a lot easier testing. Uh, you have a lot more advanced testing which you can do with the, fun with the pure functions, but I'll not go into that detail now. Um, so here the idea is to take, uh, in, in terms of Python, uh, so th this idea generally is taken out of Haskell world, where you describe all what you your describe your uh, the real world in terms of types, and you work only on types. You don't work on actual data. And in terms of Python, what you should do is basically uh, always create classes, uh, small, preferably small immutable classes, and always work on those classes. Uh, so the the other thing is don't create dictionaries and move them around in your code. Create classes. And there are nice tools to create classes. One of them is uh, ATS. The author of that is sitting right here. Uh, it helps you create, uh, Hynek uh, has created that library. It's a very nice library. It lets you create uh, small immutable classes. So you create objects and you can move them around anywhere. Uh, when you're able to, when you're performing actions within Python, think about just representing that one action as a separate function. Um, and isolate it into that one function and move that function around everywhere. And let that function um, you know, be passed into other functions and then performed. Uh, when you start isolating these small pieces of actions in a separate, as a small functions, you can see that it makes a lot, you know, it, it, your code uh, becomes a lot cleaner. It's, it's easier to find out where there are side effects and you completely avoid uh, global state. Uh, a better way of doing that is, once you have figured out that, okay, these are the small actions I want to perform, you represent it as a bunch of functions. An even better way of going about it is to actually use this library. Uh, it's called effect. 
Uh, my coworker, uh, uh, Chris Armstrong, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. He has written it. It's an awesome library. We are actually using that. So this library helps you uh, represent actions as a bunch of immutable data structure. And you can then completely work uh, on just the data structure and perform it at some point of time later. The ideas are basically inspired from Haskell's IO Monad. So the, the whole point of this talk is basically to uh, have small imperative shell uh, that performs, uh, uh, sorry, small imperative shell that actually performs the actions. And your core of the, the, your application is pure. And one of the advantages of that is much better unit tests. If you, I cannot tell you how much actually it is, but once you use effect, you realize that you, um, you don't need to create mock, uh, uh, you don't need to create mocks anywhere in your code. And the, 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 the tests just become extremely functional and they're much more easier to write. So how do you know when you have to apply these kind of ideas? When do you think it is, if you take an existing code base, how do you know at what point of time you can start using small bits of pieces to use effect? Uh, one of the ways which we figure it out is when you have a lot of, when you have a code which does a lot of mocking, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of tests which will have a lot of mocks in it. And we all agree that mocking is good, but it's not best because you can always have some silent test here and there which passes, but actually it's, it's buggy. So when you have a test which have a lot of mocks, think about using effect. It'll, it'll already get mocks. So one of the examples we have is uh, uh, Rackspace Autoscale Convergence, where uh, convergence is a feature where when you tell Autoscale product that I want X number of servers, it will do whatever it can to bring that number of servers up. So what it does, it creates a plan and executes that. So instead of us actually creating, directly executing it, we first created a plan and we built tests around that plan. Sorry, my time's up. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that concludes Lightning Talks. Um, I want to thank the speakers, and I want to thank the awesome AV folks for helping out. So let's give another round of applause. All right, and if this has inspired you, you should think about a Lightning Talk next year. Um, so next up, I have the pleasure of introducing Van Limburg, the president of the PSF.